Welcome to Getting Heated, the place to debate and discuss all things surf-related. Surfers and coaches, is it really necessary to have coaches at the events? And the biggest key to becoming a better competitor is up for debate. It might not be what you think. Plus, Mick Fanning and Salema Masakela named the most stylish surfer on tour. Finally, making an injury comeback. Is it mental toughness or physical ability? Let's get these heats started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Getting Heated. I'm Coco Ho, and today we've got a lot up for debate. Let me start with introducing three times world champion Mick Fanning and our wildcard spot on today's show, Salema Masakela. Welcome to your first Getting Heated. Thank you, Coco and Eugene. I've been waiting for this moment my entire life. Let's go! <laughs> yes, yeah, great to see you, Salema. I'm excited. Yeah, guys, I love being in your presence. Let's get into Heat One. A handful of the CT athletes will be without their coaches due to travel restrictions. That includes Mike Parsons, Ross Williams, Charlie Medina, Reynos, amongst others. So here's the Heat One question. Do the surfers really need their coaches at each event? Salema, as the wild card, you go first. Oh, you're throwing me on the hot seat right off the bat. Uh, I love it. Listen, I think that surfing is generally speaking uncomfortable. And I think that um, professional surfers, even though they're in a jersey, they should have an opportunity to be a little bit more uncomfortable. And coaches not being 100% present, I believe, is a good thing and gives the athletes an opportunity to really show up as their whole selves. Like you have a plan, you know what your game plan is, and you go out and execute that. And I don't think it necessarily needs people on the beach waving signals in this way and that way. Um, all the antics uh, of, of on-beach coaches, I think, has become a little bit much. And as we've learned during COVID, all you need is basically like to be able to communicate in this way. The coaches are going to be able to watch heats. They're going to be getting more data, probably from watching the event online and then having these conversations with the athletes. So um, in my opinion, I think it's a very, very good thing. Yeah, look, I can see it going both ways. Uh, a lot of the work that you get done with a coach is away from the event. You can't really get all that much done at an event because you're surfing with the world's best surfers. Uh, so I can see that side of it. But surfers like that extra little security blanket here and there. Uh, someone on the beach might see something a little bit different here or there uh, and be able to throw something in, be able to throw like, oh, maybe go and check this bank or maybe there's a trend in the judging that you're not really paying attention to. So do the surfers actually need them at the beach and doing all the signals? No, I don't think so. But I think it's also good to have someone to bounce ideas off. It doesn't necessarily need to be a coach. I took friends on tour from time to time and I had way more fun, to be honest. It seems to me like it, it is also like a, a, a case by case basis with the type of coaches that someone has. You look at the relationship, uh, for instance, at the top, as Coco mentioned, um, for for Gabrielle and Charlie. There's a few more layers there, right? In, in family, we've watched him go from being a teenager to becoming a man and being more like assertive of his own self. It'll be interesting, interesting to see how he performs without that security. That was a big part of his insulation for so many years, having Charlie and family, and now to have that a little bit more independence. It'll be interesting to see whether or not that allows him to be a bit freer um, in in this situation. So I'm, I'm eager to see what that looks like. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. There's a perfect example, I think, in the experience that Lakey Peterson had in her world title year. What do you think about that disconnect when Mike Parsons had to be at Jaws and the comp was on at Honolulu? To me, that's an example of... Um, that security blanket that Mick mentioned, like if 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 your coach is such a security blanket that if they're not there, you can't perform, then maybe the maybe the the balance of the of what the relationship is relative to your own belief in yourself, it could be a bit off. Now, obviously, you know, Lakey wasn't aware that 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 Snips was going to have to leave, but her performance without him there 
was a market difference. To me, the coaches should be adding seasoning. They should not be like the entirety of, of what your performance is going to be and what you have to give. Your confidence shouldn't be shaken with them not being present. Not at a world tour level. Maybe, you know, at an NSSA level or a juniors level, but if you're a world tour surfer, you know what you have to do. It's your responsibility when you're, when you're in the water, coach or no coach. When we return, the keys to becoming a better competitor are up for debate. And Salema and Mick named the most stylish surfer on tour. I think some people are about to get their feelings hurt. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Getting Heated. I'm Coco Ho, joined by CT veteran Mick Fanning and our first wildcard guest, Salema Masakela. Salema, if you could get an actual wildcard into any event, which one would it be? Jeffries, obviously being of South African heritage, but just the years growing up watching Aki, uh, you know, if I could take my blocky approach on my back end, fire me in Jeffries. Perfect. I'll be your coach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, hopefully Mick can share his tips on how to come into an event as a wild card and win the whole thing, which is what we'll dig into in Heat 2. These days, athletes have so many tools from coaches, trainers, sports psychologists, and so on. So here's the Heat 2 question. What's the single most important thing an athlete can do outside of the water to be a better competitor in the water? Salema, what's your take on this? Well, to me, Coco Ho of the legendary Ho family, I believe that energy is everything how an athlete decides to manage their energy outside of the water, uh, manage their space is going to affect their performance in the water. That means what type of things that you're doing? Is it stuff that's gonna build you up and keep you in a good headspace? I think those are things that athletes learn kind of the hard way and don't come in too late, but managing your space and your energy according to how you're made up, like what works for this person who's out all night long uh, the night before the event might not play well um, for you. So space and energy to me. I'm going to go with mindfulness on this one. It's that only that one, one, two percent where people are like, oh, how do I get from being 10th in the world to being a world champion? And to me, that's controlling what's going on upstairs. How many times have we seen athletes just crumble, absolutely crumble in a heavy situation? And I feel like the surfers in quarantine right now, it is the perfect opportunity to work on this. Just figuring out what triggers you and what upsets you for the day. I think that's that's a huge key, especially in all sports. It's funny that you bring up quarantine, like those who are able to have fun with it figure out a way to like take these two weeks to be able to do what I love as opposed to like why do we have to be doing this I'm going stir crazy etc etc those who are having fun with it and managing that space i.e mindfulness as opposed to those who are just in bitch mode um oops can I say that you can say that <laughs> <laughs> those who are uh those who are who just bitching about it, it it'll be interesting to see, you know, the the, the ratio and how how that affects uh, how people finish in the event. Yeah, it's going to be funny to see who comes out of quarantine relaxed and who comes out like, you know, adding new tools. Like, how often do you get to sit down for two weeks and be able to go through your whole program and just be like, can I add this here? Can I delete this? You know, this is the time where they can really sit down and build a, a out of the water program and really believe in it. I think that you give your this next generation too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the kind of mindset that you would take. I don't know how many of, of this next generation on tour are thinking of it that way or, or seeing that opportunity. Maybe mixed coaching uh, is uh, is next, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that, that <laughs> they're not taking that kind of stuff. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. So, Salema, who do you think is managing their energy best right now in quarantine? Ah, uh, I mean, my most, I, I'm going by like what I've been most entertained by. 
Italo obviously is just is is a fan favorite because he's just setting the Instagram on fire with the workouts and it's the same energy that he has in the water. Again, we talk about managing space. Like Italo is the kind of person who can be around a thousand people up until he gets to the water's edge and it's going to serve him. So I, I like Italo the fact that he's doing the same thing. And then I think Griffin. Griffin's just having a blast. Like I would just watch the Griffin channel because he's just like, all right, cool. Like um. I'm gonna try some handstands and all right, guys. I love you. Like, that's his energy. So, the people who are being most themselves, I think, are the people who are gonna perform the best. Those are the ones I've been most entertained by so far. Mick? But you bring up Griffin. I, you, you, I think most people think that he's a bit of a goofball, but deep down, he's always searching for little things like, you know, the key to this, the key to that. He came and stayed at my house last year before the events were canceled. And he was going through my bookshelf and he's like, what's this book about? What's this book about? Is there any, you know, little secret recipes here and there? And I didn't see it from the outside until I was actually in the same space as him. I think he's probably someone who's really nutting this out and um, he's going to come out of the quarantine firing. We're seeing a lot of different quarantine styles. Let's continue the conversation of style points for Heat 3. Scoring a Heat is all about speed, power, and flow. But what about pure style? I personally love this question because I'm asking you guys, which surfer has the best style on tour right now? Mick, go ahead and make someone's day. <laughs> oh, wow. This is, um, this is really tough one there's so many amazing styles on tour ethan ewing's a guy that i just feel every time he puts on a clip or every time i see him surfing in person just flows and it just gets from point a to point b with little or no fuss and just unleashes some of the biggest turns so ethan's a kid i've watched since he was like 14 and he just keeps getting better and better each and every day on the style side i like it i like it i mean He's so good that it's flawless, so that's a good answer. But for me, if I had a choice, like, who could I look like style-wise? That is Stephanie Gilmore. Steph is just pure grace and flow and movement, and whether she's riding a door, a single fin, high performance, or if she's out at sunset, like, the manner in which she is able to flow and really be in tune in wave communication in a way that looks so effortless. Like when I think about that wave at Karamas that she got, like to me, that was the best wave served of the entire event between the men and the women. And her style just continues to evolve with more wisdom. She's my favorite person to watch on a surfboard who's on tour. It's hard to argue with you there, mate. For me, when I look at style, it's like, that makes me want to go surfing. That makes me want to just stand there and try and look cool. I guess someone like Joel Parkinson was one of the most radical surfers in the world, but he just made it look so easy. It was so, so beautiful to watch those big swoops and stuff like that. And yeah, look, Steph just stands there. She just glides up the wave and everything's in place. There's nothing that shouldn't be where it is. And it makes you want to go out there and ride a single fin, or it makes you want to go and just burn a section just to do a soul arch out the top of the wave. Yeah, I think if someone who's never surfed before watches someone like Steph, I, I think they say, oh, is that what it's supposed to feel like? Because I want to I want to feel like that looks. Exactly. That's the definition of style. So yeah, Steph. Yeah. Growing up, who was the person that you wanted to feel like? Just getting psyched to go surfing. Who, who was the person that made Salema want to feel like that in the water? For me, it was Tom Curran. Who about you? Yeah, look, I guess the people that I idolized growing up, Mark Richards, very unique style, you know, the wounded gull, arms were actually everywhere, but it was just so unique. I just loved that. And then as I started getting into my teens, Taylor Knox was a guy that I try to emulate my surfing of. When I went surfing, I wanted to feel like I was Taylor Knox. I'm for Steph times a thousand. Yeah, hundred percent. When we return, we're going deep into what forms the mental toughness behind surfing's greatest comeback stories. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Getting Heated. Mick and Salema were three heats in, and I'm glad I'm not a judge because this is really tough stuff. That man might have a couple of world titles uh, that are in the picture, three to be exact, but I'm feeling confident, Coco. 
<laughs> I always struggle with the wild card. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm still feeling nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Salama, so you're such a big part of the series, Billy. What was it like to dive into the comeback story of our boy, Billy Kemper? When Billy came to me and said, hey, I want you to be a part of, of telling my story, I, I couldn't say no. I was with Billy at his house just a couple of days before he went on that trip to, to Morocco, and he was on such an incredible run. It was so cool to see his energy, and then obviously what happened, I got to be with him through part of his rehab, um, and, and watch his drive and then to be able to be a part of helping to tell that story. I'm just really honored that he asked me to be a part of it. We saw in the series, Billy, a horrific injury leaves an athlete unable to perform. Oftentimes they're even written off. But just as Billy proved, a comeback is possible if you're willing to work for it. So here's the going deep question. Do you think the mentally toughest competitor has the advantage over the most physically gifted? Mick, you've been through many comebacks of your own. Start us off. Wow. Uh, look, mental toughness is something that um, you, you need, especially in a situation like Billy's been through. Uh, I've been there many times. I just got sent this photo the other day, and I didn't have mental toughness. Look at that. I was just fat, and uh, <laughs> it was... It was, I was, I was a shell of a man. That was during my 2004 where I ripped the hamstring off the bone. And I didn't have the mental tools to keep me at a very happy place to, to get me through it. Uh, it wasn't until I started surfing again, all that happiness started coming back. Mental toughness, you go through some extremely dark days during injuries uh, and you've got to have love and support around you. And you've also got to have that drive to want to go in and push through that pain and um, believe that that light at the tunnel is always going to be there. Otherwise, you just get lost and you just get swept to the side and it's, it's really, really hard to get through. Yeah, I mean, you can have all the physical attributes. You might be even have a body that heals at like a superior speed. But mentally, emotionally, spiritually, like when you dig inside of yourself, that's really that's 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 really the key um to healing because it's you have to be able to overcome adversity in billy's case you know doing his pelvis and having the, to have his knee reconstructed plus the lung issues plus happen, having it happen uh, at the brink of covid being in a foreign country um having to get back to the states all of these things right and then you, you weigh in some of the things that he's experienced in the past with the, the loss of his brother, the recent death, the death of his mother. There's an ability there to go to the well of pain of, of having overcome before. Unfortunately, you know those levels of adversity very, very well. I imagine, though, that you're able to take some of that as strength when you go through things now. Uh, for, for me... It was just a lot of checking in with myself, you know. Back in 2004, I didn't have the mental tools to to keep myself happy. And, uh, you know, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, but it was so dim. I didn't know if I was going to surf again or not. Fast forward to 2018, where I did my knee, I had the mental tools. I was pretty sweet. I was like, yeah, I'm doing this, 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 and this. It's, it's easy. I'll get through this one. And... But even, even times, a lot of the times I would check in and be like, are you okay? I'll just ask myself that. Look in the mirror and you can't lie to yourself in the mirror. Uh, yeah, going through those tough times, it definitely shows you that it could be a lot worse than what it actually is. But you still, doesn't mean you won't fall into those dark ditches every now and then. Yeah, and, and the, the body can heal 100%, but if your mind hasn't bought into the fact that it has healed that's harder than any rehab that you can do is getting to that period where you believe that you really believe 100 percent that you can go out even harder than you were before which makes billy's comeback so insane to do in the same season to believe like not only did i just do all of these things to myself but i'll be back in eight months to surf not at a pedestrian level but the biggest waves in the world pushing forward forward big wave surfing and that that's that's between the years and here
100%. 100%. Uh, I was talking to Billy every now and then um, and just, you know, watching what he was doing via Instagram and I was so inspired, you know, that I'd look at him just doing these workouts and I knew he had a broken pelvis. I knew he had blown out knee. Um, and it's like, stop sitting on the couch, get yourself to the gym and go do your rehab. And he, he inspired me even through the later part of my, my training and stuff like that. He inspired me to get out there. But then talking about the mental side of it, there are things still upstairs, like going surfing once you, oh, my knee's strong. But then all of a sudden there's a lip coming for you. You're like, oh my God, it's the most scariest thing in the world. Mick, I have a question for you. What is the difference between the comeback of a physical injury versus an emotional incident with the shark in J-Bay? Yeah, they're totally two different things. Uh, with a physical injury, you know how to get back. You go and see a doctor, you go and do reps in the gym. With the with the shark incident, it was something that, it was all upstairs. You know, I was totally fine. I didn't have any scratches on me or anything like that. But it was, you know, I had a little bit of PTSD where if I heard a splash behind me or a wave break or, um, you know, I told my friends this and they started playing games with me and splashing behind me, I would jump. My feet would come up on my board so quick. And it was, um, yeah, it, it's something that still lives with me today. Also on top of that, I had to go through is like with dreams and stuff like that. Is this real? Is it not real? And I was just going through that same battle each and every day until I got to a place where I could push them all to the side and be like, I know what's real. I know what's not. And just make sure if something does happen, you're ready. But as I said, I still can't figure out the splash of behind me. It's still something that sticks with me today. Yeah, I, I do that with a splash. So don't feel bad by any means. That does it for today's episode. Salema, how was your wild card experience? Um, you know, I've, I've never gone up against a three time world champ before. So I get to click that uh, box and I can say that it was really an honor. I had a blast. Um, so good to see you both. Mick, can't wait to see you in real life, buddy. And thanks for this. This is a blast. You too, Salema. Thanks for gracing us with your amazing presence. And uh, cheers, Coco. That was really fun. I enjoyed that one.